Today's message is the helper, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Join me in the spirit of prayer. Lord God, may those things said today that are true be engraved upon every heart, and anything said that is false be quickly forgotten and cause no harm. In your name we very humbly pray. Amen. The text that I'd like for us to focus on is that very first verse. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In the letter to the Hebrews, we read that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from the morrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That text came to my mind as I reflected upon the story of the Good Samaritan. There is a way of reading scripture that dates back to the third century that is called Lectio Divina, which means to listen and to study. There are four steps to the process. Read, meditate, pray, and contemplate. A simpler way to do this is to read a passage with a truly open and curious mind and to look for what jumps out at you as you read the passage. You will, I believe, oftentimes be surprised at what you find. You will see things that you never saw before and consider things that you never considered before. And so was the case with me as I read this very, very familiar parable. Now, I've heard the story of the Good Samaritan since I was a child in Sunday school. And I've preached on it many, many times over the past years, the past decades. And I'm sure that you have heard the story, read the story, and heard sermons on it many, many times. But as I was reading the text this time, something jumped out at me that I had never noticed before. It was not the lawyer's trickery trying to make Jesus stumble, but rather it was the word I. What must I do to inherit eternal life? One does not earn an inheritance, do they? Isn't an inheritance a gift? Isn't the control of an inheritance in the hands of the giver, not the receiver? If it is anything less, then it is not an inheritance, but rather it is a wage or an expectation. And so I began to think that the lawyer's question was based on a false premise. That seems to be the, what was happening here, because a little later in the reading on verse 29, we see that the lawyer wished to justify himself. He wished to let other people know how good he was. And maybe he wanted to remind himself how good he was. His question then was not one that was asked in order to gain understanding, but rather one to gain advantage. And Jesus responded to the lawyer by asking what he thought about the story that Jesus was going to tell him. The lawyer, when asked by Jesus what he thought was the answer to his question, the lawyer replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The opening words of the Shema, very familiar to Jewish worshipers in that day and age because the faithful said it twice a day during their morning and their evening prayers. The words come from Deuteronomy as well as from Leviticus. And Jesus replied, that's right, do this and you will live. In other words, you will not only know the talk, but you will walk the walk. Knowing what we should do and doing it are two entirely different things. 
They are impossible things because life gets in the way. We lose our temper. We lose our nerve. Maybe even both. We lose our temper and our nerve. This is what the Apostle Paul was writing about, I believe, when he wrote in his letter to the Romans, I do not understand my own actions, for what I do not want to do is the very thing that I do, and the thing that I want to do, I cannot do. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this fate? And then almost as if he's had divine inspiration, Paul pauses and says, ah, Christ Jesus. The lawyer knows what love is. He knows what the commandment says. But now he wants clarification, justification. Who is my neighbor? I know that I must love my neighbor as I love myself, he seems to be saying, but knowing who my neighbor is, I can also know who my neighbor is not. Is my neighbor the person who is like me? The lawyer wants to build a fence, a wall, if you will. He wants to know who's in and who is out, who is worthy of his love and who is not worthy of his love. And when we focus on building a fence or a wall, focus on who's in and who's out, we cannot see the other as a fellow child of God created in the divine image, just like you and I. Jesus could have said, well, everyone is your neighbor. But instead, he told a story. Once upon a time, there was a man traveling down a dangerous road when he was brutally mugged, stripped, and left for dead. You know how the story goes. Why the priest and the Levite didn't stop may make for some interesting speculation and some footnotes, but it is really of little concern in the telling of the story when it comes to answering the lawyer's question. A neighbor is someone who is lying on the side of life's road and needs help. It does not make any difference who that person is or who you are, for that matter. Loving God means that you love the person who is lying by the side of life's road. And it means treating that person with the same love that you treat yourself, which means a costly love. The Samaritan's journey was interrupted by the man by the side of the road. And it required something from the Samaritan's wallet. And the cost continued as the Samaritan took an active interest in the welfare of the traveler's future well-being. When he told the innkeeper, care for him, and when I return, which I will, I will reimburse you for any expenses that you have incurred. When Jesus finished telling the parable, he asked the lawyer, who treated the traveler as a neighbor? Which one of the three? The one who showed mercy. And Jesus, as you may recall, concluded, go and do likewise. Note that Jesus did not say, if you do this, you will inherit eternal life. This is because eternal life is not about doing. It is not something to be earned, but it is about being. It is something that is given. And it is something that is received. Several years ago, I had a colleague who a part of his assurance of pardon or of forgiveness after the morning's prayer of confession would always challenge the congregation with these words. Live into your baptism. You have been baptized. You have been adopted 
into God's family. You have been adopted into the family of Christ, who is your brother. So having, having been adopted by love into the family of God, why don't you live like it? To God be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? Our Lord God, open our hearts and our minds and our eyes so that we can see who our neighbor truly is. Help us to see those who have been broken and wounded by life and lie upon the side of life's road. Help us to be bold enough to not only minister to them, but to seek reconciliation. Help us to mend our broken relationships. Help us to let go of the grudges and the hurts that we hold so tightly on to and that separate us from one another as well as from you. Lord God, keep us mindful of the fact that your grace is sufficient for us and that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. We lift up in prayer those families and individuals who have been separated from loved ones by circumstances or by death, for those who mourn what was and are afraid of what will be. We offer up prayers of thanksgiving for your many tender mercies and blessings that have been poured upon us in our own lives for family and friends, for employment, for riches beyond measure. Lord God, help us to live into our own baptisms. Help us to be proclaimers of your kingdom, heralders of your love, so that when our days here on earth come to an end, we might hear the gentle whisper of a familiar voice saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the glory that has been prepared for you. All of these things in the prayers of our hearts we offer up in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I charge you to go out into this world and return no one evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but learn how to love and forgive one another as freely as God in Christ has loved and forgiven each and every one of us. And may the love of God that will never let you go, the peace of Christ that passes all human understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that knits us together as the body of Christ here on earth be with you today, tomorrow, and all of your days. Amen. Rashad Reeve, owner, founder of Armshot Studios at Creativity Uncorked in Peoria, Illinois, downtown at 819 Southwest Adams. If you're ever in the area, come by and check us out. Uh, it is uh, the home for my original artworks, and we do art parties for the community. 
uh, serving all kinds from church groups to school groups to everything in between. So I'm also one of the or the resident artists at St. Paul United Church of Christ in Pekin, and I'm very honored to be affiliated with them. It's a family affair with us uh, within the arts and within serving the community. And one of the things that I was uh, found myself being personally enriched in having this new relationship with St. Paul's a few uh, many years ago was their art collection. And there were several uh, pieces of art within the building that I would admire and study just being a natural artist in me. And, and uh, many of them were the pieces that I'm now finding out were created to commemorate a young man that uh, tragically lost his life. You said your brother was an art major, just, you know. He was just, he had, my mother and, and my brother had art in their bones. My mother liked flower arranging and all that kind of stuff. And my brother would go around to all, to the old people in the church and put up their Christmas trees. From the time he was six or seven on up until he died, he was in charge of decorating grandma's Christmas tree in the house over here. She liked what he did. Because <laughs> he just liked that sort of thing. That's really nice. That kind of brain, just to have that kind of brain. I, I don't. <laughs> Very capable himself. He, he was ambidextrous. He was better with his bad hand than I was with my good one. But, uh, Paul was killed in a fiery car crash. Yeah. was in the Springfield, Springfield, Illinois burn center for about two weeks. They amputated at least one leg, maybe both. Did all kinds of skin grafts and things that he just, he couldn't make it. I was wondering why the family would choose to memorialize your brother with such a wonderful, expansive fine arts piece? Well, because my mother was an amateur artist and so was my brother. He was in college, he was an art major. Great. Part of the conversation that I do remember was after he died, there was some life insurance on him. And I remember a conversation where my mom and dad were talking about what to do with that money. It's not like they felt that they could spend it on themselves okay. they to do something with it. And my mother, and I don't know how the, the, it came about, but my mother decided to do um, an art piece or pieces and donate them to the church. How she found that artist and how the artist decided on the parables is a mystery to me. It is beautiful, isn't it? Because it's beautiful. Yeah. The, Oh. Very thought provoking. I mean, you don't see everything the first time you look at it. No, there's no, the details are, are hazy and you have to, you see, it's like the Bible. You see something different every time you look at it. Every time you read that scripture, something else comes out. Right, right, right. You know, I remember when um, my father died and we were down there for the uh, funeral. You had an interim pastor, I think, there. And my grandmother's house had not yet been torn down. They tore that down and gave the land to the church. And I remember that the pastor was talking about different kinds of homes. He was talking about the home my dad grew up in that has now been torn down and the land given to the church. And he talked about the heavenly home, of course. And then he talked about how my dad hung the lights in the sanctuary where you are now. Art that has a story uh, behind it or, or uh, a driving force behind why it's created, a lot of times can, can add another layer, another layer of power, another layer of uh, exploration. Because uh, I, just as an artist, just in studying the work, studying the casting, studying the, the technique, I had already uh, had my own uh, stories or experiences with that piece without finding out this information about why it was created makes it even deeper. And it's uh, always an honor as an artist to be commissioned because for one, it's one of the things that solidifies your, you being a professional within that realm. And for two, it gives you a, a chance in many cases to have your work, your work presented uh, permanently to a large body of people. And uh, 
getting as many eyes as uh, possible to interact with certain styles of artwork is, is uh, one of the paramount things that I like to do and what I like to, the goals that I like to strive for as an artist in St. Paul has given me that opportunity to join the class of the, the artists that created the, the piece that was used to, uh, to celebrate uh, the life of the young man that tragically lost his life. So again, I'm always very honored to be able to participate in that and add my style, and add my, uh, my twist to these, uh, to these things and then uh, <clears throat> adding the, uh, the spiritual aspect of it is always, always a great and fulfilling thing. So again, thank you guys and uh, we look forward to continuing to do more and continuing to build upon the arts and the arts community throughout uh, the PE community and beyond.